think so. Okay, it's uh, four o'clock. It's even a few minutes after four, four o'clock. So welcome everybody. Uh, those who are here and uh, those of you who are listening in wherever in the world you happen to happen to be. Uh, we're going to talk about the monetary policy report, uh, Per Jansson and my, myself, uh, and our view of the world and uh, what's going on in the Swedish economy and the, the conclusions we have drawn when it comes to Swedish, uh, Swedish monetary policy at this, at this present, uh, present juncture. Uh, the main conclusion this, this time is, is basically to say that uh, given the uncertainty abroad and given uh, the turbulence that we see in various parts of the world, of course mainly in, in Europe, all this taken together slows down also the, economy, the, the economic activity in the Swedish economy. And given that that is the case, uh, then uh, that uh, led us to the conclusion that, that there was no need to change the monetary policy rate uh, this time and also the conclusion that the repo rate remains uh, low uh, for some time, some time to come. On the other hand, eventually, as uh, the way we look at it, uh, eventually things will return to normal also at this time and, and that means that then slowly, of course, uh, in a more, more sort of normal world, the, the, the policy rate will start moving, moving up. Uh, the key focus uh, presently and maybe even more so than many would have expected given the meetings and discussions uh, yesterday and last, uh, last night is of course the, the issue with, with public, pu public finances. Here you see the US, Greece, Italy and Ireland just, just as a few, few, few examples and there are two, two parts to this. One is how to deal with this in the short run, what to do, what kind of packages you need, how much money do you need, how do you actually go about solving these issues, what kind of conditionality do you need if you have, let's say, an IMF F program. And that's, that's now and for the next quarter, six months, year, whatever. And then the other issues, of course, what to do, how to make this stay on track for, for a number of years, number of years to come, because eventually for these things to settle down, the, the debt to GDP ratios will have to to be uh, reduced one one way one one way or the other. The the Greek uh, uh, the Greek graph here is probably wrong in the sense that if 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 the PSI public sector involvement process continues at, at least the way it has been described as of as of early early this morning, uh, the the dotted line is likely to be lower one way. One, one way, one way or, or the other. But of course, all of this means that in those parts of the world where this goes on, it will affect the aggregate demand in one way or the other because these things will have to be paid for. And then in turn, uh, this uh, causes uncertainty and eventually, particularly in a, an open economy like the Swedish one, this will affect aggregate demand here because it creates uncertainty. That's one part of it, and also export demand will be a bit lower than, than other, other, otherwise. And uh, as you as a group are well aware of, this creates turbulence in financial markets in various ways. Here we just chose to, to show this in terms of uh, uh, stock indices, it, one can take CDS spreads and a whole bunch of other graphs. All of them are sort of versions of the same theme that if there is uncertainty, you get volatility. And if there is a lot of volatility, things happen in markets and, and you end up with a constant discussion about where, where the world is moving and what it takes to reduce volatilities in these systems as a, as a whole. And here, if you look at the red graph, um, yeah, look at the our stock index. You, as you can see, it's been quite volatile, and, and but fairly in line with with the other ones. And that kind of reflects that um, in an uncertain world, you get there is volatility. While on the other hand, uh, the type of volatility we're talking about here hasn't really been created in the domestic economy. So the, it's had, it has its root causes uh, elsewhere, but still we are we are affected. And part of this, then, and part of the result that you get, given that this is what is going on, is declining confidence. Here, as you can see, here we're talking, we have a purchasing managers index. 
and as you can see here, this affects the whole the whole world. We're getting down to sort of more more normal levels compared to the extremely high levels that we have seen for a few years a few years back. And this is, of course, then, then something that affects uh, aggregate demand more, more or more or less. And as you can see here, we have substantial differences in, in growth. This this pattern is pretty much the same, and it has been now for quite a while. And, and that means that you can look at the world in three different parts. Uh, you have at the top global growth, which is still actually quite good. And then on top of global growth, in order to get the yellow graph, you actually have a number of countries uh, where growth is much, much higher than 4 4%. And of course, in this type of world, it's quite favorable then if you can increase exports to those, part, those parts of the world, because then that means that you are less vulnerable when it comes to demand in low growth countries. We have the US somewhere in the middle. People are talking a lot about what's going on in the US, as always. Uh, but on the growth side, uh, it, it, it's not all that, all that bad, clearly in positive positive territory and as far as we can judge it's likely to stay there and then finally if you look at the euro area it's a bit on the bit on the low side which is not surprising given what's what, what's going on in southern su southern europe and that's that's likely to affect the euro area for some years to years to come <coughs> and you when this is translating translated then into to uh, views on the economy in, in, in Sweden, here represented by households and companies, you can see that the confidence indicator is on the way down, coming down from a very, very high, in a historic perspective, very, very high level, but now it's, it's, it's something which is sort of much, much more uh, normal. And then the issue before us is, of course, uh, what will happen with the red graph and the blue graph in terms of where these, these graphs are gonna, gonna go going, going forward. And, and then what that means in terms of growth and, and economic development in the Swedish economy in, in general. Part of this is slower consumption growth. Uh, what is important here, though, is that we're not talking about a reduction in consumption. We're actually to only talking about slower consumption growth uh, uh, next year, and then, then uh, consumption will bounce back. And consumption will bounce back basically because in our main... Main, main, main scenario, the way we look at it, uh, things will normalize over, over time and that, will all, that also means then that, that then consumption, con consumption comes back a few, years, a few years out. All in all then, this adds up to moderate growth. Uh, growth which is actually towards the end of the period fairly close to the, to the, to the average growth that we have seen over the past 10 years or, or so, but presently of course uh, for next year, a bit bit on the bit on the low side, uh, and uh, reducing the projection for for next year that we started doing uh, this uh, spring. So in that sense, uh, there's nothing dramatic actually about the projections that we're doing this time compared to the way we have been looking at it for the past few past few monetary policy decisions that we have that we have talked about. So it's not that all that much has actually actually changed. But but all in all, of course, uh, growth numbers that are completely different compared to what they've been in the past 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 few years. Uh, but still as far as we can judge something that will normalize over over time. This then you know, translates into cautious employment plans. Uh, as we can as we can see here, this is what uh, what we get when when, when, when people are asked in the, in, in the business sector about their employment plans, and given that growth is slowing down, it's not so surprising then that we're coming down to a sort of more, more easy, easy to recognize uh, level. And this then, of, of course, as a consequence of this, means that we'll see a slower improvement in the, in the labor market, will take, where it ta will take uh, uh, many years for unemployment to gradually, uh, gradually move, move down. Behind this also lies an assumption that the wage negotiations that are going on and that will be going on in the next year or so will be in some sense normal, that, that we're talking about wage increases uh, within a range that we recognize and, and understand, wage increases that are in line with wage increases 
increases of a level that we have observed over the past 10 to, 10 to 15, 15 years. If that were not to be the case, if, <coughs> if, if we would end up in a completely different territory, then of course all of this would, would change in one, one, way, one way or the other. And this uh, uh, then translates into moderate inflation over the, over the horizon here that we're talking about. Exactly in the same way as before, when you look at these two graphs, the CPI will stay above 2% for most of the time, given that we're carrying interest rate increases with us. While on the other, on the other hand, CPIF taking out interest rates here is going to be a bit below 2%. But, actually, but then over time, when the demand in the Swedish economy increases, uh, then that will push up inflation a bit. So we expect to, to, be, uh, to have a CPIF, which will be very, very close to target. And then, of course, if that means that we end up in a very stable environment, which is hard to know, then over time CPI and CPIF will be actually quite, uh, quite close to each other. This then uh, means that the repo rate will uh, remain low. And, 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 and as you can see here, we have uh, adjusted the interest rate path a bit, which means that uh, in this projection, the policy rate will stay put for sometime into the second half of, second half of next year, and then it will gradually, gradually go up towards something which is no more, more normal, because still in a historic perspective, 2% is, is a fairly low uh, nominal, nominal rate. But as always, it's a forecast. It's not a promise. All sorts of things can all sorts of things can can can, can happen. If you look at the probability distribution, it says that the rate can can be anywhere between zero and seven percent three years out. So there is a lot of uncertainty here in the in the system. A couple of uh, examples uh, are included in in chapter two in the report, coming up with scenarios that kind of explain what would happen if, if things were to turn out in a, in a way that is different compared to our main, main, main scenario, our main projection. Inflation is actually quite high in various parts of the world, and if, if inflation were to stay high, then eventually that would also, in one form or the other, uh, spread into the Swedish economy. And in that context and in that, in that environment, if the inflation rate were to go up here as well, then that, of course, would mean that the repo rate would... Uh, uh, rise faster compared to otherwise. Similarly, if all of a sudden uh, the financial issues uh, that we have in Europe, being it on the bank side or when it comes to public finances, were to be settled much sooner than expected, then that would bring clarity to economic uh, developments in, very in, in, in Europe and that would, highly, that would likely then increase aggregate demand in Europe, and part of it would end up here, given that a lot of our exports um, go to the countries that we're talking about here. And then that would also push up the policy rate. While on the other hand, if these things drag out, if, if there is a, a kind of a muddling through process that takes years and years, then of course that would have the opposite effect, because then that would affect exports and demand in the Swedish economy in such a way, in such a way that um, inflation pressure is taken out of the system and then that would uh, push uh, interest rate uh, hikes uh, further into, into, the, into the future. Uh, so now, uh, in addition to, to this, uh, Pat uh, will go through uh, one, of the, one of the boxes that we have in the in, in the report where we explain in greater detail uh, how, how things seem to evolve over, over time when it comes to dealing with the fiscal and financial uh, sector issues in, 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 in Europe. Do you want to press the uh, button? I, can, we I can press the button. You can, leave, you can leave that on for, for the moment. Mm. So the way we describe our main scenario basically is that acute problems uh, will be dealt with in an orderly way, I think is, is the wording that we have. Uh, and, and that's the assumption, uh, another way of describing is what Stefan said, a muddling through assumption. An orderly way doesn't mean that everything works perfectly, uh, but it does mean that progress is made over time. And it's clear that uh, some of the more fundamental uh, public finance problems will take uh, a long time to correct. So that's uh, in the picture as well. 
Uh, and we also have an alternative scenario where we uh, assume the reverse. So in that scenario, things aren't dealt with in an orderly way and uh, problems uh, become more acute and it's, it's more difficult to handle uh, uh, the situation as we go along. And what I want to do now is to highlight a few key factors that we think uh, uh, sort of supports the orderly way assumption that we have in our basic scenario. And when I do so, I will draw basically on two boxes in the report. There's one box that uh, talks about similarities and differences compared to 2008-2009. And there's another box called the debt crisis in Europe. And what, what I will say sort of uses evidence from, from these two boxes. So let's first uh, have a look at the basic problem. Uh, this is a graph that shows you debt levels and uh, uh, budget deficits over the period 1997 to 2007 as, as an average. And what you can see here that, uh, is that uh, some countries, uh, of course, already had problems in, in kind of fulfilling the requirements of the Stability and Growth Pact before the crisis came in 2008. That's not new to you, I presume. Uh, but, but it's an important factor. It means that the fiscal problems didn't sort of come uh, uh, last year or so. They have actually been there for a long time. Uh, but it's clear that uh, the crisis has made this worse in the sense that more countries are now kind of not fulfilling the Stability and Growth Pact. I think in 2010 there were five countries uh, uh, that did fulfill the pact. And I think the estimate, according to the Commission, is that there will be four countries this year maybe even free if things go, go badly. So uh, the problems are kind of getting broader and more, more countries are, are kind of uh, uh, in, in the same situation as Greece were uh, for a longer period of time. The second problem that comes or, or becomes worse with the crisis is that there are some short-run refinancing problems by some countries which kind of tend to get acute, as you know. Um, so basically, uh, the problem is both on, in, on the long side and the short side. We have some acute problems that need to be dealt with, and then we have these structural problems that also have to be dealt with sooner or later. Um, but uh, w one thing that, uh, that is much better than uh, a couple of years ago is that uh, some support facilities are in place now uh, in order to, to at least partly deal with, with the problems. And here you can see the picture that on the right side kind of accumulates uh, uh, the different facilities that are available. And if you do the calculation there, you get a number of something like 750 uh, billion euros that are available. Uh, on the left side, you have the financing needs uh, coming from both predicted uh, deficits in 2012 uh, and also the, the rollover that is needed uh, uh, looking at the, at the stock situation. And what you can see here is that as long as sort of Spain and, and, and Italy do not enter into, into sort of the problem region, you can see that the muscles are pretty big in these support facilities. But it's also clear that uh, if Spain and Italy, maybe also other countries, would, uh, would sort of uh, start having problems, then, uh, uh, you know, it, it, it's not difficult to imagine a scenario where, where uh, uh, the EFSF and, and these, these other facilities would, would start to run short. And that, of course, is also one of the reasons why this is being discussed at the moment, how the leveraging of, in particular, the EFSF uh, can be achieved. And I guess you, you saw your communique that came yesterday, and we have to see how these details are worked out in the future. And also one piece, importantly, here missing is that there's no concern for bank financing uh, contributions. That could also be something we have to see to what extent these facilities will be used there, but that could also be a component that that implies that there's a need to boost these uh, facilities uh, one way or the other. Uh, but having said that, uh, as I started to say, it's clear that having access to such facilities is a general improvement compared to the situation in 2008, 2009, uh, and something that is important uh, when thinking about uh, the likelihood that things that happened back then would be repeated. 
Another thing that is quite different is the uh, uh, situation in terms of liquidity. So you can see this enormous spike that, that uh, in the US, but also the spikes that came in the euro area and in Sweden uh, around the Lehman collapse. And you can see some increasing of, of and this is the, sort of the basis spread, the difference between the three month interbank rate and the expected policy rate. You can see some tightening also occurring now, but not at all at the levels that we saw back in 2008. And if you, you can actually decompose this thing and look uh, what, what is driving this, is it uh, credit uh, premia or is it uh, liquidity premia? And if you do that, you will find out that in 2008, this to a large extent was driven by cre uh, credit premium uh, increases, whereas that's not true at all uh, at the moment. Uh, sorry, liquidity premium increases, that's not true at all at the moment. So liquidity premium are much lower uh, now than they were back then. And of course, at least one reason why this is the case is that authorities have intervened and have provided liquidity. Uh, that's true for central banks and also some other authorities, I guess. Uh, and, and this is something that is in place and uh, th there's a certain practice established there that, that uh, uh, is useful if things start to get worse again. Um, so, to summarize the most important argument, as, a, as we see it at the Riksbank, Bank, uh, for uh, more limited real effects uh, this time than in 2008-2009, uh, uh, one first aspect is that the problems are well known, so to say, today. Uh, and we know how to deal with fiscal problems. Uh, uh, there's experience at the IMF, of course, but also the European Union dealing with the Baltics and other countries. Uh, have been training themselves in doing this, so, uh, so that's positive in the sense that people, people know how to deal with these problems. And also these problems, as I said in the beginning, didn't come as a surprise, which I guess at least part, partly was the case in 2008 uh, uh, in the crisis back then. Another uh, difference, I, I think, is transparency. Uh, today we have much better knowledge about the potential problems in banks than we had back in 2008. And this, I think, partly is thanks to the stress tests uh, that have been undertaken, uh, which have provided much better information about the situation in banks uh, than we had back uh, a couple of years ago. Of course, this is a gradual process, and these stress tests are sort of repeatedly criticized. But nevertheless, they have provided more information, and you can sort of draw much more conclusions uh, when you look at them today than than you could before. And I guess this is positive, uh, for example, in the current discussion when, you, when it comes to recapitalization needs of the banks. Um, liquidity then, as I said, uh, I think is a major uh, uh, difference and an important factor that there's readiness today in providing liquidity in a, in a completely different way than, uh, than, than were the case in 2008. And more generally, I would say credit provision to companies and household displays much less contraction today than it did back in 2008. And that, this is something that can be seen, for example, in the euro area uh, bank lending survey. So this is a couple of arguments. Of course, it's impossible to, to do sort of a, a, a full list, but a couple of arguments uh, that we think... Um, Although there are risks, of course, and this is why we have a risk scenario, but a couple of arguments uh, for uh, reasons for being more optimistic today than, than back in 2008, and also for making it less likely that the collapse back then will be repeated this time. So that's, that's where we are when it comes to our, our views on what's, what's happening presently, and what is then needed when it comes to Swedish monetary policy? Questions, reflections on, on this? The conference has been unmuted. <laughs> uh, yes, one question about your assumption of the international policy rates. If you look at uh, you're still, even if you have lowered it, you're still fairly aggressive on you know, your outlook for both ECB, Bank of England, or Federal Reserve. Uh, while it seems like they are more leaning towards providing additional easing instead of returning to any hiking in the very near term. So just how are your thoughts on that? Or? 
I guess in the shorter term, uh, we basically uh, make assumptions about policy rates that are in line with what you can kind of uh, derive from, from what is priced into the market. And then in the longer term, there starts to arise a difference. And, and uh, the way we think about this, I mean, in, in, the, in the market pricing, there are some technical problems when you look at the longer end, but it's also hard to see that you would run negative real rates for, I guess, decades, which would be the implications looking only at, at pricing. So we do assume that at some point in time, the real rates have to become positive. That's an underlying assumption. You could discuss the timing of this, of course, uh, but this is basically what, what is going on there. And then there's a difference, I guess, between policy rates and other measures that could be undertaking over and above uh, changing the policy rate. Uh, just a question on, on uh, resource utilization. I guess uh, you can measure that in so many different ways. Would you say that it's, uh, well, how, how would you look at that? And would you say that it's higher or lower? Is that no, something that's been discussed? I think the way it's, I mean, you, you, you can find the, 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 the exact phrase in the, in the report, but basically we say that, uh, that resource ut utilization presently is a bit lower than normal, but it moves to normal in the course of, of the time period that we're talking about here. But then, I mean, you can pick a number of measures, and, and, and that means that you can calculate this in many different, many different ways. Uh, yeah, one question more on the banking sector and the uh, credit. Because um, if you look at the banking sector now in Europe, it's very much bigger than the economy as a whole. It's like two, two to three times as big. And now when we have the new requirements to increase the, the core tier one ratio to 9%, um, that will probably lead to a balance sheet reduction. So... Um, are you sure you can be so optimistic about you know, lending to companies and households going forward? Um, because my belief is that if banks are starting to reduce um, their balance sheet, it will be, become much more difficult to companies and households to, um, to obtain credits from banks. Yeah, but this is provided that you actually recapitalize these banks, and, and that's what we expect to happen when one, one, one way or the other. If you don't do that, then, then, then of course there is an issue, but then that takes us into a different, different world compared to our main, uh, main, main assumptions when it comes to, uh, when it comes to all, of, all, all of this, because it's, it has been, it's known already, if you look at it from, let's say, a Basel III perspective, that for years to come, these ratios will go up one, one, one way or the other, and that has been known for quite a uh, Quite a while, quite a while already. I mean, that another issue which is kind of around the corner is then to reflect on what kind of a banking sector do we actually, do we actually need in Europe? Uh, because another way of looking at it is to say that well, maybe it was too large from the beginning, given that we ended up where we did in terms of leverage and and, and all the issues that, particularly those countries where they have had, let's say, a housing market bubble, have had to deal with. Because clearly, in those in those cases, the the banking sector is just going to have to shrink one way, one one way, one way or the other. But it's, it's not. It's at the same time. I think it's important to keep in mind that we're, when when we're talking about Europe as a whole, it's not that every bank and every banking sector in Europe is in trouble. That's not that's not at all, not at all the case. Right, was there somebody on the phone? Yes, uh, I have a question regarding the the confidence indicators because in a Monetary policy report that says that the, that the market tensions fit into the confidence indicator, and I wonder whether the RICS band did any calculations how much of, of the dipping in this data can be explained by the market. Can you repeat, can you repeat the question? What, what came into the confidence indicators? Uh, the market tension. The market tension. Yes. And the question is? Uh, if there are any calculations that would quantify this impact. Okay, well, that's a bit difficult to answer, but I guess uh, the situation, uh, I think, clearly in Sweden, but to some extent also, I guess, in other countries, is that uh, hard data, so to say, I mean, uh, production and, and, and labor market developments and things, things like this, 
look look fairly okay. I mean, there's some some weakening there, perhaps, but but not that much. And what we where, but where we clearly can see signs of weakening is in terms of these confidence indicators. So, for example, the National Institutes. Uh, 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 business tendency survey shows uh, clear and rapid weakening as Stefan showed was one of the pictures and then I guess the, the key question is to what extent is this a signal for forthcoming weakening in terms of GDP and labor market and, and things like this and uh, I, I guess we have squared in things like this uh, in the sense that for example if you would run uh, simple models using these informations our forecast is a bit, bit Less a bit more pessimistic than than what you would get using uh, this information. So in a sense, we tried to anticipate that the, the, there are coming effects there that are a bit bigger than you would now just gorge from the data that you can see. Okay, more. I have one. Yeah. Uh, please go ahead. Uh, well, we'll take the the telephone first. Okay, so, uh, uh, please go ahead. Okay, so, so one more question now about the currencies. Because there is there is an argument in the chat on the market about Swedish Krona becoming some sort of a quasi safe haven currency, if that would stay in line like this and let's assume that the global economic conditions we deteriorate in line, I mean deteriorate more than in, in your current forecast, uh, but not as much as to justify some cuts yet, would this itself an impact from a stronger than historically justify if currency have an impact on, on, on monetary policy decision eventually or will always stay the same currency is not a factor well it's Thank you. I mean the currency is not a factor in the sense that if you look at what's in the report it's a very very traditional exchange rate projection that we have that we have in there and for years it's been constantly very very difficult to to, to figure out where, which way the exchange rate is going to go and it's uh, it's it's most likely that that's the way it's going to going to stay. Okay, uh, to a question about the Swedish uh, domestic economy. Uh, one is, uh, despite that you have cut the growth prospect for the Swedish economy fairly broad way, you still have working hours who increase more than employment. It would be interesting to see how that would be possible. Isn't isn't uh, a natural reaction from from the business sector to first cut uh, working hours before employment. Uh, that's one question. The second one is: it seems in your report that you you now think the the lending, the household lending growth, has going down a little bit sharper than you have expected earlier. Um, what do you think is the reason behind that? Uh, has it anything to do with that you have changed your view about the impact of uh, your repo rate to the mortgage rates? Have you increased your assumption about the mortgage rates? Or do you see any other factors? And how do you have you any estimate about the lending growth going ahead, going forward? A couple of issues there. One is that the loan-to-value ratio has now been in, in place for some time and, and it seems to have an effect. Uh, also, and, and this is more kind of anecdotal, is, is that the banks are also more keener to make sure that their customers are actually amortizing compared to in the, in the past, which is not unreasonable in the sense that it wouldn't be good if the debt-to-income ratio went up forever because then it can come down and that quite fast and that that's a problem that, that that that's a problem so 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 those two reflections kind of point in the in the direction of what we see when you look at the when you look at look, look at the numbers at the same time the the margin for mortgages has has gone up and we've said in the past way back that the margin we observed then was way too low. It didn't really reflect what was going on in the financial sector and it did not reflect the risks in the system. Now this process has been going on for some time, been going on for some time and margin, margins have gone up. Uh, hard to tell where, where this is going to stabilize. So in, so in that sense it's really difficult to, to, to pass judgment on that. Clearly, clearly we're going to have a much higher margin than we've had in the past. but. Where, where it will end up kind of on average is, is hard, to, 
hard, hard, hard to say. Then on top of that, we have all these short-run issues when it comes to financing and funding. Swedish banks don't have problems. They don't have any problems when it comes to, to their funding side. And in some instances, it has actually been easier for them than for many other banks to, to deal with the funding issues. But still, there is a bit of kind of dysfunctionality in, on, on, on the funding side. And that also something that kind of feeds into the into the system and then all things considered if you add the uncertainty on the other side that we talk about when we talk about the household sector it's not that surprising that, that the numbers are lower compared to what they have been in the past and in some sense taking a longer perspective that's not bad uh, because they've been too high too high in the past on the other hand if you look at the corporate sector and uh, then you can see that the numbers are up and now the, the numbers are quite uh, households and corporates are from a numbers point of view, quite close to each other. And, and, and it's not unreasonable to have that kind of a, a development because then if the corporates keep borrowing and if they are, if they are making, a, making a healthy, healthy profit, that's the way, the, the way things should be. So if, if, uh, if, uh, if those two graphs um, cross each other, it wouldn't be all that, all that bad. But then to make these projections in terms of sort of at the m almost micro level where, where, house the, where the household sector is likely, likely to end up, that's, uh, that's hard to do. On the, on your question was why uh, uh, hours worked were increasing quicker than, than employment. Yes. yes, I can't give you really a good answer. I have to check with the experts why that's the case. I mean, it has to do, uh, must have to do with the average hours worked assumption, but exactly why that is the case. I mean, the, I can note here that the difference isn't very big. It's a couple of tenths, but I have to check it and come back to you on that. Okay, I have a question. Um, it's about the prolonged alternative scenario. Uh, we have a, um, a glit of dark uh, development, and it wasn't long ago that we thought that we had a booming housing market in Sweden. So now you say in your alternative scenario that we have a pretty good that we can handle the crisis fairly well if we were to get the prolonged uh, financial scenario. Um, but don't you think that maybe house prices, have you thought about that? Would this be the uh, blow to the housing market and maybe now house prices will fall dramatically and then the uh, turnaround will be much more prolonged that you have in that scenario? Or maybe you didn't take that into account in this alternative scenario? Well, I guess in an alternative scenario like that, I guess the, the point, I guess, is that, uh, sure, there could be some corrections in the housing market there. I guess the tensions that, that we have had are less today than they used to be. I mean, the housing market has been cooling down, broadly speaking, that comprises both, I guess, price developments and and other things, so, and, and, and the credit, uh, uh, credit expansion is, is coming down as well. So in a sense, I guess that's, that's a good starting point, uh, or better starting point at least, than if you are in a strongly rising trend for debt and, and, and prices. But sure, in a scenario like that, house prices could correct a bit more uh, uh, downwards than, than otherwise. It's always possible to come up with scenarios where everything goes wrong. <laughs> <laughs> and, but that's, I mean, it's an, it's an issue. It's, 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 hard to, it's hard to judge, but I, I, I do agree with Per that it's a, it, it, it's a good thing that uh, things have slowly slowed down compared to more, more, more dramatic, uh, dramatic uh, moves. And, and basically, I mean, the, looking at the big picture, the, 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 the Swedish economy compared to a number of other countries is, is in a very good, very good position compared to many others in, in, the, in the sense that inflation is... Is is quite uh, quite stable. The fiscal side is just fine. Debt to GDP is just fine, and we continue actually to, as far as we can judge, to run a current account uh, surplus. And that, of course, is uh, taken all together. It's a it's a good spot to be. So a speedy credit growth or and house pricing developments won't hold you back for l lowering the interest rate if, or the repo rate if you had well, to. Well, that's a that's a hypothetical hypothetical question because if things were to start picking up too much on the housing side, then of course one someone would have to do something about that, and then you have a choice between either, either to use the policy rate or loan to value ratios, amortization requirements, and 
and the whole set of what nowadays is called macroprudential macro prudential tools. We haven't really used the machinery in this country to, to use types of, those types of tools for a long, 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 long time, but they certainly are there. And one more tool that is on its way is, is, is a, a counter-cyclical capital buffer, uh, which, uh, which we ju just haven't used in the past, and then one would need to go through the motions to, to calibrate that. But, but that means that th there's, a, there's a toolbox out there uh, that, we can, that we can use. And uh, my guess is that for years to come, uh, people will discuss what is then the proper composition of, of tools and what is the proper, uh, the, the proper balance of tools. Because the more you l use administrative measures, the more imbalances you create somewhere in the financial sector and the more incentives you create to to create a shadow banking sector and do all sorts of other things. And that means that in, in one way or the other, the, the level of the policy rate has to be reasonably aligned with the other tools that are being, uh, be, being used. But uh, time will tell because uh, how to find the proper balance there, that will, um, that will take us into new, exciting and fascinating territory that will keep, keep people bus busy for years. Okay, if there are no more questions, uh, thank you all for coming. And those who uh, have been watching and listening in on the phone, also thank you. Thank you for listening in. Thanks. <laughs>